Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again today. I want to begin today by asking all of our licensed healthcare providers across the state to sign up for a new emergency alert system so that in the event of an urgent need, our public health officials will be able to ask you for your immediate assistance. This includes all physicians, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, uh, physician's assistants, respiratory specialists, medics, LPNs, certified nursing assistants, podiatrists, dentists, anyone who has made a career in the medical profession. This is different than the siren system that's for doctors only. This is for emergency alerts for all our licensed healthcare workers. Please register on our website at illinoishelps.net. Illinoishelps.net. Your fellow Illinoisans need you. Your state needs you. By signing up, you'll be joining an alert system that when activated will ask you to deploy to assist in our response to urgent needs during this public health crisis. Together, we truly can make a difference, and that difference will save lives. Again, I ask you to register yourself at IllinoisHelps.net if you're in the medical profession in any capacity whatsoever. Please go to that website and click on Register Now at IllinoisHelps.net. Additionally, thanks to your amazing outpouring of support, our healthcare workforce is expanding. We have now received more than 510 applications from former healthcare workers to get back into the fight. And we began sending out the expedited temporary licenses and permits yesterday afternoon. Still more healthcare workers are needed. If you have recently retired or left the profession to start a new career, please come back to work for at least the next few months to help us battle against COVID-19. This afternoon, the United States House of Representatives passed the $2 trillion emergency aid package, and we await the President's signature on that very important bill. I'll continue to work with our federal counterparts to bring in as many dollars home to Illinois as possible. I want to take a moment today to address some of the latest ideas that have been floating out of the Oval Office. President Trump yesterday went on a talk show to question whether Americans really need more ventilators to save people's lives. Um, he did this on the same day that our nation overtook China and Italy having the highest number of COVID-19 positive cases. To say that these comments are counterproductive uh, is an understatement. And frankly, at, at worst, the comments are deadly. When I said that the bedrock of my decisions was science, I meant it. The equipment we have, the equipment we're still seeking, these are the recommendations of the best medical experts, epidemiologists, mathematicians, and modelers in the nation, all of whom have set aside their daily duties to help save as many lives as possible. We need exactly what we're asking for, perhaps more. If we don't get the equipment we need, more people will die. The president needs to use the Defense Production Act to put order into the market for ventilators and PPE. It will prioritize Americans over foreign countries and allow states on the front lines to access the equipment we so badly need. He needed to do this to activate the Defense Production Act weeks ago, or even yesterday, but it still will make a massive difference in our national health care system if he simply moves quickly. One way or another, we need these supplies. And I have a whole team of people whose singular focus right now is working the phones calling across the world to get as much PPE, as many ventilators, and as many tests as possible shipped to Illinois. This morning, because of my state team and their hustle and working all hours of the day and night, 
we received another shipment of state procured N95 masks. And they have been in the process of delivering stocks of PPE, that is our staff, to Champaign, to Peoria, Edwardsville, and Marion. We will not rest until each and every region of our state has what it needs. But without the federal government, individual states don't have enough market power to procure what is needed on their own. So I urge the president to join us in this work and take the federal actions that are available to him and to him alone. I want to provide you an update on what my team and I have been doing to ease the burden of this moment on our most vulnerable residents, our families, and our children. I'm glad to be joined today for the second day in a row by our Department of Human Services Secretary Grace Ho, whose staff has moved mountains and then some to increase the depth and breadth of Illinois' human and social services network, including easing access for newly eligible users and temporarily eliminating the renewal process wherever possible for organizations. We're also joined by Carolyn Ross, representing the nonprofit organizations across Illinois who are stepping up in this critical time. Most of you are adhering to our stay at home order, but not everyone has a home to go to. Not everyone has a safe home to go to. Not everyone has the same ability to put food on the table. Not everyone can stay at home with their children. These are problems that existed long before COVID-19, as did the need for a meaningful solution. But it is especially important right now that we are doing all that we can for all of our residents through this crisis. We want every eligible person to be able to access services as easily as possible. So I want to walk you through our ongoing efforts to simplify and expand the available support. As I go through these offerings, if you need any of these services, you can find more information on accessing all of these measures at our main coronavirus website, coronavirus.illinois.gov, coronavirus.illinois.gov. And please, whenever possible, do use our websites if you can. Although our regional offices remain an option for those who need them, for your own safety and that of our civil servants, I ask you to avoid visiting our offices if you can access the internet and get what you need online. First, let's talk about childcare. I announced exactly one week ago that we were going to make sure that our essential workers have safe daycare for their children while they do the critical work that keeps us safe. While children who can stay home should stay home, we want to make sure that every child in Illinois has a safe and supervised place to go. I'm proud to say that we've received more than 600 applications for small group emergency child care licenses from people, organizations, schools, and communities looking to help their essential workers from healthcare professionals to grocery store employees. Additionally, hundreds of our childcare homes are staying online to provide care in socially distanced settings. And now we will be providing each of the providers who stepped up in this time of need with an additional stipend, $750 each for licensed homes, $2,000 each for centers running one or two classrooms, and $3,000 each for those running three or more classrooms. Applications for these grants will be available beginning Monday through your local child care resource and referral agencies, and again on our coronavirus website, <coughs> coronavirus.illinois.gov. Parents and guardians looking to find child care should call our toll-free statewide number 888-228-1146. Again, that's 888-228-1146. Or to visit our Families and Children resource page on coronavirus.illinois.gov. My administration is also working closely with the statewide hospital and healthcare associations 
to make sure that our state's hospitals child care needs are being addressed. I also want to talk about food access, something top of mind for so many parents as schools have closed and layoffs have skyrocketed. First, I want to remind everyone that as long as schools are closed, students who qualify for free and reduced lunch can get their meals through their local school districts. And we continue to encourage school districts to work with our Illinois State Board of Education and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand their programs to all of their area kids. As for programs like SNAP and the Women, Infants, and Children program, WIC, my team at the Department of Human Services is submitting multiple waivers to the federal government to deliver as much nutrition support to as many Illinoisans as possible. Already, we've been able to automatically extend SNAP certifications set to expire March, April, or May, another six months, until September, October, and November. We've also been able to waive the physical presence requirements for SNAP applicants and participants, enabling people to further reduce the time that they spend outside their homes, and increase people's ability to apply for assistance online. Anyone who needs to apply for or to adjust their SNAP benefits can now do so remotely on our Department of Human Services website at dhs.illinois.gov. Again, if you need to adjust your SNAP benefits, you can now do that online at dhs.illinois.gov. We're expecting an additional $80 million in federal money to come to Illinois in April through the SNAP program. That's another $80 million of food on the table for our residents' impact in our communities. And I'm grateful to the team at DHS for all their work to bring as many federal dollars as possible to Illinois. Illinois is also home to many residents who don't have a permanent home to stay in. DHS has gone through its budget with a fine-tooth comb and redirected millions of additional dollars to address all aspects of homelessness assistance statewide with a focus on expanding our ability to offer temporary shelter. That's on top of the doubling my administration has done of the state homelessness prevention program over the last year. We're also increasing all of our existing state homelessness service contracts by an additional 5%. That means more dollars to homeless shelters and permanent supportive housing. These extra dollars will help our partner organizations enact social distancing measures within existing spaces. Finally, if you're experiencing domestic violence or you live in fear of it, I know how much scarier and more complicated the message of stay home might sound to you. If that's the case for you, please know that you can call our Illinois Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-877-863-6338. Again, if you are experiencing domestic violence or live in fear of it, you should call our Illinois Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-877-863-6338. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to our Illinois Department of Public Health Director, Dr. Ngaze Azike, for today's medical update. Doctor. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Governor. And again, just thank you for your, your passion and your commitment to the people of Illinois. You should all know that he is a, an ardent supporter of science, and he's pursuing every piece of data that we can give him to make sure that he is making data-driven decisions to make the most important, difficult decisions for the people of Illinois. And I just, I thank you for being that kind of leader. Today, I'm sad to report that there are 488 new cases in Illinois for a total of 3,026 individuals with COVID-19. Unfortunately, this includes eight additional deaths for a total of 34 lives lost since the beginning of this pandemic. We also have additional counties that have been included in, in the rolls. We have 40 counties across Illinois. As we expected and as we have feared, the greatest number of hospitalization is among individuals older than 65 years of age. 
and approximately 86% of those with COVID-19 who have died here in Illinois are over the age of 60. We must continue to do all that we can to protect our older adults, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, who are most vulnerable to serious illness and death. We also must make sure that there are enough medical professionals to care for those who do endure the more severe illness and the attending complications. Again and again and again, I want to thank our medical and our healthcare workers who are literally on the front lines. While we are telling the public to shelter in place, to stay at home, we are asking them to go where the patients are, to go where the illness is, to save their lives. We are asking for all licensed healthcare providers who are able to join the response, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician, assist physician assistants, medics, dentists, podiatrists, registered and licensed practical nurses. Everyone, please register at illinoishelps.net. Since March 19th, over a thousand medical and non-medical volunteers have registered to help in our fight against COVID-19. All of these individuals will be critical, but we still need to have more help as this pandemic continues. I also want to thank and offer words of encouragement to those who are providing essential services and those who are supporting the people who are providing essential services. These include people who are providing daycare for the children of those who are providing essential services. It also involves the sanitation workers who are keeping our workplaces clean. We all have our parts to play, whether it's a healthcare provider, a person providing an essential service, those who are supporting others to do their work, whether you're staying at home as you've been instructed, whether you're a kid foregoing your play date, washing your hands frequently, keeping six feet away of distance, all of these steps is what it will take, all of us doing this together to end this pandemic. And now I will repeat the comments in Spanish. Hoy estoy reportando 488 casos nuevos, un total de 3,026 personas en 40 condados de Illinois. Desfortunadamente, esto incluido, incluye 8 muertes adicionales para un total de 34 vidas perdidas. Como pensábamos, el número de hospitalizaciones son personas mayores de 65 años. 86% de las personas con COVID-19 que han muerto tienen más de 60 años. Debemos proteger a nuestros abuelitos y abuelitas. Ellos son más vulnerables a enfermedades. Quiero decir gracias a nuestros trabajadores médicos que están en primera línea. Solicitamos que todos los proveedores médicos con licencia que pueden ayudar en esta respuesta se registren en www.illinoishelps.net. Tenemos más de 1,240 voluntarios médicos han registrado por, para ayudar en nuestra lucha contra COVID-19. También quiero decir gracias a las personas que están dando servicios esenciales. Esto incluye a las personas que cuidan a los hijos de nuestros policías, enfermeras y bomberos. Nos tomará todos trabajando juntos para poner fin a esta pandemia. Con los voluntarios y trabajadores, vamos a levantar Illinois. And with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Ho. Good afternoon. Now more than ever, the value of and the necessity for human and social services is clear. Like healthcare and safety, essential life-giving and life-altering human services are not only still available, DHS is expanding and adapting access to services for individuals and families across the state who need help now. Thanks to the strong, kind, and clear leadership from Governor Pritzker, we are also working to ensure that Illinois' Human Services Network is able to be sustained through this crisis and beyond. DHS exists to ensure that the basic needs such as shelter, food, health care, mental health, services for people with disabilities, and child care are met. We have a workforce of 13,000 strong providing direct care 
at psychiatric hospitals, at state-operated facilities for people with developmental disabilities, and public benefit offices all across the state. I am grateful to them for their dedication to helping our neighbors in our state through this crisis. To our nimble, responsive caseworkers, counselors, and call center agents who continue to help people every day, we thank you. I want to salute the nurses, mental health techs, personal assistants, direct support professionals, and other frontline employees whose often stressful, sometimes challenging work is even more intense during this public health emergency. During this pandemic, DHS's own employees and our network of 500 plus state-funded community partners are ramping up our efforts in several areas. When families and individuals experience a challenge in their lives, prenatal to older adulthood, DHS and its partner organizations are often the first place people turn to for refuge. We reach one in three people in the state of Illinois across the state with dozens of services, and there are too many to list. So I encourage you to please visit our website, dhs.illinois.gov backslash help is here to learn more about the wide array of supports available to those most in need. Today I would like to quickly highlight and go to, into uh, a little bit more depth about four crucial resources for communities across Illinois. SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Services for People with Disabilities, the Emergency Child Care Program, and Expanded Services and Supports for People who are Experiencing Homelessness. As the Governor shared, SNAP is a federally funded program that puts food on the table for nearly 900,000 Illinois households, feeding over 1.7 million people in our state and stimulating our economy. People eligible for SNAP include low-income seniors and individuals, people with disabilities, and working families. With the recent passage of the Federal Family First legislation, monthly SNAP benefits will increase dramatically, in some cases, by over 90% a month. For example, a single person with a disability or an older adult with less than $2,000 of monthly income is eligible for $194 in monthly SNAP benefits now. Before the legislation passed, they would have received $16 a month. A family of four making less than $42,000 a year is now eligible for $646 a month in SNAP benefits. Our administration, as always, want all eligible people to receive these basic benefits and, as always, are in the fight against hunger. This is important now more than ever. The, the Department of Human Services has been quickly implementing federal, federal measures and submitting waiver, waiver requests from the federal government, as the governor had mentioned, for temporary measures to increase flexibility. We have and we will continue to implement ways to help more families withstand the extraordinary pressures many are facing during this emergency. We know some SNAP participants may be unable to get to the grocery store. If you have a trusted home care provider, a family member, or friend, they may help you access some of those benefits. I would like to reiterate what the governor had noted in his remarks because it is an important point. With recent changes, SNAP expenditures for just one month, just for the month of April, will increase by almost $80 million over March. That's $80 million more a month, rolling up to about $300 million of federal assets and resources that are being pumped into the Illinois economy each month, while also putting food on the table of Illinois residents. While some of our offices are still open, we do urge individuals to stay at home to sign up for SNAP and other benefits online. Over the course of the past several weeks, we have been building up our virtual capacity. Please help, keep, please help us keep you and our local office caseworkers safe by staying home. In addition to SNAP, included among the array of services our Human Services Network provides, there are many resources for people with disabilities. More than 30,000 people now rely on the aid of a personal assistant through the Home Services Program. This program continues to promote the independence of all people who may need limited or significant supports to carry out the activities of daily living. For people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, DHS continues to make home, community-based, and other residential services available for over 30,000 families. 
DHS and our community partners across the state serve people with physical, intellectual, and developmental dis disabilities and people with mental illness. If you or a loved one needs help, please call or visit our website, dhs.illinois.gov backslash help is here. As the governor shared, the Department of Human Services with the governor's office and our sister agency, Department of Children and Family Services, launched the emergency child care program that is available for essential workers who have no other options available. In these settings, capacity will be limited to the number of children per classroom and per site. Information can be accessed through the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Education and the array of websites that we have talked about today. Before I close, I'd like to highlight DHS's work to support people experiencing homelessness. Over the past several days, we have been working relentlessly to build on the infrastructure of shelters and programs that have been partners with the state for many years to meet the dynamic needs of people experiencing homelessness during this crisis, helping our partners in enact social distancing measures for this population. DHS already funds hundreds of organizations who serve people who experience homelessness through shelter supports, prevention, and supportive housing. Last week, we announced a 5% increase to all of these initiatives and an additional $6 million in new funding to support the 19 continuums of care across the state. These continuums will be our local partners. In designing this expansion, DHS sought to be swift, flexible, accountable, and ensure locally driven decision making. These organizations know their neighbors and their community assets the best. So we are deploying funds through one fiscal administrative agent to support their work. We are pleased to be partnering with All Chicago in this effort to meet the needs of people who are experiencing homelessness right now. I am pleased to introduce Carolyn Ross, the President and CEO of All Chicago. Thank you to Governor Pritzker and Secretary Ho. Thank you so much for your leadership to ensure that all Illinoisans have a safe place to shelter during this COVID-19 emergency and beyond. Our mission at All Chicago Making Homelessness History is to unite our community and resources to provide solutions that ensure and sustain the stability of a home. We work to prevent and end homelessness through four signature approaches, community partnerships, uh, community, uh, excuse me, da data analytics, emergency financial assistance, training and research. All Chicago is responding to the co coronavirus by crisis by supporting the community with some planned strategies. We are reviewing and publishing information to inform operational in responses. We are distilling information from hundreds of pages of guidance from, city, from the city, from the state, and federal authorities focusing on what is pertinent to shelters and other providers that house clients together and living in close proximity. We are using an online channel where providers can talk to each other directly and share information quickly. Calls with providers are being held every week with more than 200 partners participating. We are increasing our availability to help disperse uh, resources using our existing emergency fund model to support our partner providers who are supporting and implementing services to our citizens who are at risk of or currently experiencing homelessness. Shelters and providers, our partners are experiencing increased costs not covered in their current budgets. This new emergency funding we are grateful as it will help mitigate some of these needs and enable our providers to adhere to CDC and CDPH recommendations. The Department of Human Services is making $6 million available throughout the state for emergency lodging for individuals and families experiencing homelessness. These flexible funds will be made available through local continuums of care, as the Secretary mentioned, which are local and regional planning bodies recognized by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to coordinate housing and services funding for our neighbors at risk of experiencing homelessness. We are jointly developing a process with DHS for application and distribution uh, to ensure a clear and uh, expedited process. Each COC lead agency will be responsible for local prioritization of funds in collaboration with local planning efforts in response to this emergency. 
Through the COC, the federal government promotes local control and allows the people on the front lines doing this work to help shape the support for people experiencing homelessness. All Chicago and DHS, we maintain and have had an effective partnership and in our collaborative effort to address homelessness. Based on our current work together, we appreciate that DHS turned to us in partnership to support the 19 continuums within the entire state of Illinois in response to the needs of the distinct communities that they represent. DHS has enlisted All Chicago to serve as the fiscal agent for this fund. Lead agencies throughout Illinois will access funding through All Chicago and work with local service providers to pay for solutions that are responsive to the unique needs of communities throughout the state. The funds are intended to provide the temporary lodging costs for an effective response to the COVID-19 emergency. While the funds are intended to be flexible within that focus in order to supplement local resources and planning efforts, it is understood that these funds may not be efficient, excuse me, sufficient to provide all of the necessary supports that homeless providers or persons experiencing homelessness will need during this time of this emergency and beyond. Some examples of support are going to may include hotel and motel costs as temporary alternative housing uh, identified in communities across the state, facility modification and expansion costs for some of our existing providers who can who to equip and furnish alternative facilities and areas within existing facilities not normally designated for shelters, increased staff costs to expansion of shelter uh, provision in additional facilities so that we can keep these facilities operational, and other costs will be considered to allow flexibility to use funds to fill a critical temporary lodging need outside of what is pre previously listed. At All Chicago, we will continue our mission to support the community through our established emergency fund in which Chicago residents can apply for assistance by calling 311 and ask for emergency assistance to receive these services through the Chicago Continuum of Care. For additional information, we have developed a link on our website at www.allchicago.org backslash coronavirus. And now I will turn it over to the governor for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I just want to point out to everyone that although Carolyn represents an organization called All Chicago, she is representative of the organizations that are dealing with homelessness all across our state. And um, she's doing a terrific job here in this region and representing people across the state. But I just wanted those of you who are listening, watching, who are outside of Chicago to know that your local organizations are being funded um, that our Department of Human Services covers the entire state of Illinois, and I'm especially concerned to, to focus on homeless people who often are forgotten, uh, perhaps in the commentaries uh, that get made, but, but who are so vitally important to our state, and we're gonna uh, make sure that we uh, stand up for you no matter where you live uh, in the state of Illinois. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Dan. Governor, there, there's um, a lot, large number of people who on, are. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um, Mayor Lightfoot's move uh, yesterday to close down parks and the lakefront? Has there been any discussion statewide to having all municipalities close down, for instance, their public parks? Well, we did close down our state parks um, across the state, and we have encouraged local governments, just as Chicago did, to make sure that they're keeping an eye out to see if people are, in fact, adhering to stay at home. Many places in Illinois, people are doing exactly what we asked. Um, I know it was a beautiful day, uh, and so people were, you know, felt like they should go out on the lakefront, didn't realize, some of them, how many people would be there. People need to be attentive to the idea that even if you had a plan and you thought perhaps there weren't gonna be a lot of people in some park that you're going to, if you see a lot of people there, please don't go there. Please understand that being with a group, even if you think, well, they seem to be safe or they don't seem to mind, um, in fact, any large groups who are not uh, adhering to our 10 uh, number limit and who are not adhering to the six foot social distancing rule, um, you are in danger. Uh, and you are putting other people in danger if you don't adhere to these rules. And just one follow-up. Um, I know the stay-at-home order is, 
issued until April 7th at this point, yes. but has there been any discussion um, or talk about extending the official stay-at-home order beyond the 7th of April? Hey, Dina, you know, the truth is we evaluate this every day. We really do. We, we, we try to look at the trajectory of the uh, people who are uh, tested positive for the virus. We look at the trajectory of the hospitalizations and the issues around, you know, the, the deaths, of course, that are occurring, the ICU beds. Um, and we ask ourselves, you know, what, what's the next move? What's the most important thing we need to do now? And more than asking ourselves, because some of us, we don't come to this as experts, though we're quickly uh, moving in that direction. But we rely upon the science. We rely upon the experts out there to tell us, are we on the right trajectory? Are we reaching a peak? When will we reach a peak? What happens on the other side of a peak? Um, so we're, we're constantly evaluating that. And um, so I think it's worthy of everybody just paying attention to. Nothing is set in stone. You've seen, you know, there's been a progression here, right? We, we were among the leaders among states to first to, to, to ban large group gatherings and then to, you know, ban, uh, to, to close schools, to ban bars and restaurants from opening and so on. But you've seen a progression, right? If I knew then what I know now, perhaps I would have put a stay-at-home order in back, you know, when we uh, shut down St. Patrick's Day parades. Um, but but we're evaluating the science as it comes in and making the moves that we think are necessary. Governor, can we ask about testing? Uh, this lady, I'm sorry, this next lady here asked for the question. Yes, thank you, Governor. Uh, there's a large number of people who are homeless due to some level of mental illness and they've been sleeping in our parks and so forth. They have nowhere to go. They have no access to a phone or a computer. How do we keep that population from becoming criminalized because they're on the streets in the places that are closed? So uh, I, let me say this, that, that as our comments here today, and you, you know, you heard Carolyn talk about it and you heard me talk about it, we're very concerned about the homeless, about the possibility that they will become infected, that they'll infect each other inadvertently, of course. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, I was concerned about the homeless uh, before I, you know, we ever came across this uh, virus and the crisis that we're in now. Um, so we're working hard to, uh, to provide, uh, we're contracting with hotels, motels, other shelters to expand capacity across the state, especially during this virus. Um, and so we're, we're continuing to do that work. Uh, it takes time, you know, if we could have done this before, uh, we would have. Uh, now, you know, because there's some, you know, a, a real public health crisis, um, now we're, we're, you know, we're trying to make sure that we're doing everything that we can for every resident of the state. It's the right thing to do. We're gonna to continue to invest in that. You know, food, clothing, shelter, uh, the basic needs that people have, you know, there, there are people who already were experiencing the need for that before this virus came along, and this is now an expanding population. And so we're gonna do everything that we can, and again, working with our existing agencies, the nonprofit organizations all across the state to see if we can house everybody. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Craig, did you wanna? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to ask you kind of a two-part question about testing. Um, as of March 12th, we only tested 300 people yesterday, there was a five, we got about 5,000%, over 16,000. That only puts us 28 nationally, you know, so what are we doing to expand testing capacity? And what are you doing to acquire more tests? Yeah, so remember that I, I've been one of the, the, the loudest governors on the subject of testing because uh, the truth is that there isn't much testing going on across the country. You can imagine that uh, what we've experienced is very similar to what many other states have experienced in terms of what's available for testing. Um, I just wanna remind you that there's an entire supply chain associated with testing. It's not just like, well, here's a test and you know it's one thing. It's actually made up of viral transport media and nasal swabs and RNA extraction and, uh, you know, and then the machines themselves, uh, which are expensive, the Roche machines and others that are available. And there are only so many of those in the world. And what do you know, there's a shortage of virtually every one of those items. It's why we asked the president to, to invoke the Defense Production Act. It's why we asked the president to loosen up the uh, ability of, of uh, hospitals to develop their own tests, which they finally did do. And thank God we've got some of the best hospitals and healthcare providers. Uh, research institutions in the world, and so they were quick on it, and we were able to ramp up more testing. We're working every day. I'm watching those number of tests. 
I have given more of an answer than I should because we have a doctor here who is in part responsible for three of the state labs. We were the, some of the earliest state labs in the entire nation to do testing, and Dr. Azike has been engaged very closely in this issue. So, yeah. so of course, as you mentioned, we were the first uh, public health lab in the, in the country to bring the testing online. But in addition to that, we have been able to uh, allow other entities in the state, universities and, and private hospitals, we have given them the tools they need, they need to be able to do the testing in their respective institutions. So that increases the capacity for all of us. In addition, the public health lab, we are going to two shifts a day so that we can ramp up the number of tests that we do. Um, we are buying the machines and giving it to other entities so that we, we're soliciting people who are able to participate in this in this testing effort. And of course, we're keeping an eye on what uh, rapid tests might be appropriate so that we can have more robust testing that we have than we have now. But So our capacity, we're continuing to grow it and increase it. We know that that's an important effort, uh, not so much in determining whether somebody would get treatment because there isn't one now, but I know that even if someone knew that they were positive, I think that would affect their behavior. If you know you're positive, I think you would be more likely to just really withdraw, make sure you stay away from, from others. And so that it is an important part of, the, of, of flattening the curve and dealing with the pandemic to make sure people are aware so that we can follow the incidents and follow the trajectory and know when we're getting to a better place. So we're aggressively working to increase testing. That's an important part of this whole COVID-19 response effort. And, and if I, if I, I can follow up on that, just a, one of the things that people have wondered is, are we seeing more diagnosed cases because of more testing or because there are actually more cases or some combination of both? Let me add something onto her question and then I, I hurry answer it, uh, Dr. Zike's answer and then, and then to your question. Um, uh, you may remember that about three weeks ago, maybe a little more, uh, the Vice President of the United States stood up and said, uh, we're gonna have millions of tests available, remember? Um, he talked about the commercial labs and putting through drive-through, uh, testing and so on and and I mean for all of us out here who are looking for more tests we said that is terrific I mean thank God because there's only so much there's only so much equipment that exists in each of our states and if you can get the commercial labs to spin up millions of tests that's terrific didn't happen didn't happen then didn't happen for another you know week went by I was screaming even louder another week went by you know louder um, you know the truth is that even now that's not true uh, the, the commercial labs are up and going and there are more tests available and hospitals are sending tests to California, to North Carolina, to other places from Illinois in order to get a test, but it takes days, several, many sometimes days to get a response from, uh, you know, after it's been sent because there's a backlog because guess what? Not enough supplies, not enough machines, even at the commercial labs. So, you know, if, again, if I knew then what I know now, I would have gone out and uh, you know, we would have bought machines, more, many more machines for the state of Illinois uh, so that we could do it ourselves. That is what we're essentially, we've been doing for the last week and a half or two weeks uh, because we realize the federal government isn't stepping up to the plate. Um, and then I, I just want to point out that there's one more bottleneck in this that's uh, very difficult to overcome. And that is, you know, even if you buy more machines, even if you get the swabs, even if you get the viral transport media, even if you get the RNA extraction, right? If you've got all that, you still need the lab technicians who are trained on the machines. And guess what? Those are in short supply too, because who knew we would need this many lab technicians? I'm sorry, but you asked another question. I wanted to make this point. And Oh, it is, are we seeing more cases because we're doing more testing or because there are just more cases out there? Both. It's a simple answer, both. We're, we're only doing so many tests, right? Um, you can see that. There's a limit to the number of tests we can do. Um, and there is an increasing, uh, so we're increasing the tests, but not enough, but we're increasing it. There's a vast majority more people out there uh, who have COVID-19 than we are currently testing. Um, and in many places, uh, many hospitals are simply assuming that if you have a deep respiratory uh, cough, uh, you know, trouble breathing and a fever, that without even testing, they're, they're often now just assuming you are COVID positive because they don't have a test to offer to everybody. 
And so uh, that is, you know, one of the challenges that, that uh, of the federal government taking so long to get on the subject of testing. We would know so much more now. We'd be able to treat so many more people early, uh, and we would have put the the uh, uh, you know the social distancing orders in place earlier. The, uh, um, we've got one more question in the room, and then we've the, got to go online. The emergency alert system that you want doctors and nurses to sign up for. What are some of the scenarios that you're you're preparing for that you think they would be deployed to? And also in regards to the president's comments that you referenced last night, is there a specific number of, of um, ventilators that you or the state of Illinois is requesting from the federal government? Thousands. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just really quickly just <clears throat> what I and this is this works to what Ken was saying. President this is just in. President Trump has ordered the use of the Defense Production Act to compel GM to accept, perform, and prioritize federal contracts for ventilators, saying the company was wasting time. So I don't know how that's gonna tie into what you were about to answer, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. Thank you very much. That is really great news. Invoking the Defense Production Act is so vitally important. As I said to the president directly, look, he's a businessman. He didn't want to interfere with the capital market, you know, with the capitalist market. He wants business people to do what they do. That's all well and good, but we are in a crisis. We are in a national crisis. That's why, you know, and I said to him, I was a businessman too before I became governor. I understand what you're saying, but the market is the Wild West out there. We're competing against each other in the United States and then against other countries for what already exists in the United States. So I'm so pleased to hear that there's some movement, but that's only GM. That's terrific. But we need more. We need much more. Um, sorry, you're, uh, you're... You said thousands of ventilators. I mean, uh, we need thousands more ventilators. We have been... I was on the phone today uh, with uh, one of the ventilator manufacturers trying to get a hold of those thousands more ventilators, um, as many as we can in short order. Um, unfortunately, you know, as you hear time and time again, like I was just saying, you're competing against everybody all the time. And indeed, we're competing against foreign countries who've been named to me, you know, in the list of their priorities at these companies. And again, that's why you need the Defense Production Act to be invoked. Um, so that we can get the ventilators here in the United States for what our needs are uh, here. If we're making them in the United States, we should be able to buy them here in the United States, but you know that's, that's not happening for everybody today, and, and there certainly aren't enough ventilators uh, going around. It's why this is such an important development. Um, and then you had another- the, uh, the emergency alert system for the doctors. Oh, yeah. What are some Maybe of the you scenarios? Could give an example, Dr. Z. K. So there's- endless um, tasks that can be done. Some would be direct care. We know that some people who will be coming back might be over the age that we wouldn't want them to be in contact with the public and risk being infected. But those people could absolutely practice telehealth, telemedicine. Um, there are people who could monitor the ICU beds remotely, the telemetry. Um, there are people who will be helping with planning and organizing. So from direct care to organization to telehealth, I mean, there's quite a range of options that these different professionals could help um, in the effort. And I think in the emergency call up, because this is really an emergency alert system, um, the idea is that if you had a day when you saw an, a big influx of potential hospitalizations or people getting you know, sicker, uh, and you know, as you know, we're looking at, at alternate sites. We've got a lot of alternate sites we're not just looking at, we're working on now. Um, we may need to, to call up people who aren't currently sort of staffing every day, um, and we may need to do it on short notice. So we want to be able to literally text them a, a broad swath of healthcare provide, uh, you know, professionals so that they might be called up to a certain location. People who live in a certain area of the state, we might say, hey everybody, we need you know, 100 or 50 of these kinds of professionals. Please let us know if you're available this afternoon, this evening, to come to this location to help us out. So that's the situation that we're in. I talked about a shortage of staffing uh, all across the board. That's the, you know, we've got to call up everybody we can, medics, for example, who are in the military, who may not be, uh, may not have been professionally licensed as, let's say, an LPN or in some other capacity, uh, you know, may have gone on to a different career, frankly, when they got back from the military. We need those people to be called up to service. All right, we've got to get to some questions yes. from other reporters. Would you please ask the governor when he expects the General Assembly to act on issues related to a proposed Chicago casino? 
Uh, I don't know. All I can tell you is that we're in the midst of, a, of an international pandemic, um, an emergency, a crisis. Uh, and, you know, look, I would like action on, I have a, you know, an entire list of things that, that we would like to get done for the state of Illinois, but uh, right now, you know, the priority is saving lives. When will Illinois begin releasing a count of hospitalizations caused by COVID-19 as other states like New York have done? Yeah, we're working on that now. I mean, we obviously, we talk to all the hospitals all across the state. Um, we get data, but you know, over, t over history, that data has been collected in different ways across the state. We want to make sure that it's all in one system. We've been piecing it together, but um, in terms of our ability to report that on a regular basis to all of you, uh, we're making sure that we're doing that. We'll be working on that over the weekend. Several chambers of commerce are asking their lawmakers to shift the minimum wage increase schedule, exempt unemployment insurance benefit claims from affecting the business contribution rate, and deferring of sales tax payments. Are you discussing any of these ideas right now? We've already deferred sales tax payments. Um, on the other two, um, you know, we're, these are obviously things that we'll want to be working through over the next uh, couple of months. Um, I just want to remind everybody, though, uh, you know, I've, I've had calls with uh, some legislators or, or others who uh, raise some of these issues that, like the minimum wage or like the fair tax or something else. And I'll be honest with you, we're in the midst of the biggest crisis in our lifetimes, at least in my lifetime, across the nation. So we'll get around to talking about those things. But right now, we're focused on hospitals, healthcare workers, and those who are sick and dying. I'm hearing employers are withdrawing job offers to would-be graduates. What is happening with college and high school seniors hoping to graduate? So we're working together, you know, ISBE uh, for graduating seniors uh, and our IBHE, the uh, Board of Higher Education, with all the universities to make sure that um, our graduating seniors at both levels uh, will be able to graduate. Um, there is, of course, some online learning that's going on in many places across the state of Illinois. Um, but we're going to make sure that everybody gets a degree. As far as jobs on the other end of that, as you've seen, there's massive uh, layoffs going on across the economy. Um, I hope that on the other side of the peak uh, that we'll begin to talk about and we are working on, you know, thinking about now, um, how it is that we're gonna be reopening all of the things that have been shut down really over the last several weeks. So, um, you know, we're on top of it, we're paying attention to it. It's gonna be a national endeavor. Are you coordinating with any other governors to prevent a patchwork of rules, especially in light of Trump's talk of reopening the country? Yeah. Well, there wouldn't be a patchwork of rules if the federal government had stepped up in the first place. Uh, but as it is, I, you know, it's my job to protect the people of the state of Illinois, and we've been a leader in doing what's right and keeping people as safe as we possibly can. Thank you to the people of Illinois who have responded so ably to our calls for staying at home. Uh, and I would just say that the patchwork is, remains a patchwork as long as the federal government doesn't step up and recognize that this is, this is a war. It's a war against a pandemic. The federal government needs to lead, and until it does, we'll be a leader here in Illinois. Are you saying President Trump should have issued a nationwide stay-at-home order? I think it's clear now that if you look at states like Georgia and others that were a little slower to get on the bandwagon, I don't want to call out every state, but you know, um, that you're now seeing a vast rise of the number of cases, a vast rise of the number of dead uh, in those states, and, um, and it's deeply concerning to me because, you know, this is one nation. We are one nation. Yes, of course, we're a federation of states across the United States, a republic, but the fact is we're one country. We are all Americans. And, uh, you know, when you've got, uh, you know, states around us doing things that are different, um, when the federal government isn't providing any real guidance here um, and telling everybody the way it ought to operate, uh, you're going to get differences of opinion about how to manage through this. Uh, I think we're doing it right here in Illinois, uh, but you know, I wish the federal government had stepped up and still has an opportunity to do so, and I implore them to. This will be our last question. Mayor Lightfoot has said she expects the stay-at-home order will be extended deep into April. Is she right? 
Um, as I said to Dana when she asked a question just like that, um, you know, we, we are looking every day at the question of you know whether we are extending, when are we extending, if we if we do um, stay at home, you know, keeping kids at home from school. Uh, we'll we'll be reporting to you as we make decisions about that. But for now, April seventh is the uh, is where our executive order extends to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.